I'm going to read a few verses beginning in verse 6. We already heard this uh, passage of scripture read to us earlier in the service, but let me refresh our hearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Three things that Paul unashamedly proclaims about himself. Not that he was somehow portraying himself as something grand, but I think he is honoring God, even as he says the words that he says over here. As we know from historical backgrounds, when this particular letter was written by the Apostle Paul, he was in prison in Rome. He had already gone through the trial. The case had already been decided. Everybody has left me, he says. All have chosen to desert my sight. All that is left for him to do is simply wait for his death. I don't think any one of us here in this room has ever had to face something like that. Having been tried and condemned to death, he was waiting for the day to come. He was certain of his death. I know that my time for departure is imminent, he writes to Timothy. The reason he is saying these words is because he wants to pass on a legacy to a young disciple of Christ who was being challenged himself who was going through some struggles of his own. He needed to hear these words. Words of a, a saint, words of a, a man of God who had seen life, who had walked this journey, who had the experience to say what he says. So when Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, listen, I have fought the good fight. Remember that. Timothy, remember, I have finished the race. Timothy, don't forget, I have kept the faith. And by implication, what he's saying, Timothy, you are going through a battle right now. You're going through a battle right now, and I know the temptation for you to give it up because the battle is too strong against you. The forces that are operating in your life are such that you would rather run away than to face them. Have you ever faced that in your life? The battle is so intense, that the fight is so strong, that the enemy is so vehemently opposed to you that 
you want to give it up. Paul is telling Timothy, don't do that. God is bringing this word to us today, reminding us, don't give up because I am not done with you yet. And I'm going to turn to another book in the Old Testament and if you're able to, you can turn to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Here we have the story of Jehoshaphat facing a vast army of Moab and Ammon coming after him with all the power that they could muster. It's a beautiful chapter and I commit that to your reading sometime. The entire passage, but I'm going to just read it to you a few verses. Verse 12, O oh God, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Be realistic of your enemy. Be realistic of who is attacking you. Make a confession to God. God, we do not have any power to face this vast army. But then the servant of God, man of God, Jehoshaphat says, we do not know what to do. But what does the rest of that verse say? But our eyes are where? Our eyes are upon you. When you are in battle, I think sometimes we make the mistake of focusing on the enemy. Am I right? Ayo, yeje ya Ilai peyne, mari. What is our strategy? How are we going to face this enemy? We focus on the enemy, we look at the giant that is coming against us. Jehoshaphat. What is he saying? Yes, he has seen the army. He has made the right estimate. It's too big, too vast. Just like little boy David made the assessment about Goliath. He, he had no misunderstanding of Goliath. He knew that Goliath was a a big force to reckon with, very powerful, a man who had the reputation of having killed in battle. David didn't pretend like he didn't know that, but David had his eyes fixed, not on the lion, but on God. We do not know what to do. It's okay to say Sometimes we think, you know, we have to be so smart, you know. We have to do all the research and we have to do all the, you know, hard work in order to face the enemy or in order to defeat the enemy. I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong, but I'm saying there is a way that God has for us. And that is to turn to God and put our eyes upon Him. In verse 14, we read something interesting. In response to this prayer, a sincere call or cry to God, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah. Verse 15, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you, and listen carefully. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. One of the first things, brother and sister, one of the first things we need to get rid of in our battle with the enemy is fear. I'm not asking you to do something that I don't ask of myself. Like you, I also face 
lot of circumstances, situations, difficult people that don't seem to give up on their attacks upon you. Difficult situations that tend to overwhelm you and, and you have sleepless nights. How many of you have that? Okay, you don't have to put up your hands. But you know what I'm talking about. We all go through that. This is what the Lord says both to the king then and to you now. If you're facing a battle right now, this is what God is saying to you. This is God's word for you tonight. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Why? Listen again carefully what God is saying. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged because of this vast army because the battle is not yours but God's. Here is a secret that I think we need to focus on. Whenever you are in battle, remember this, that it is not yours. It's not your reputation that's on the line. It's not your life that is on the line. It is God's word that is on the line. I am with you. David knew this perfectly. Without any shadow of doubt, the little shepherd boy knew that his God was able to give him the strength to overcome this enemy, this giant, this Goliath. The battle is not yours, but God's. I want, if you have your own Bible, I want you to underline that. Don't underline the church Bible. Go to that verse every now and then when you're facing troubles in life. Whether it's in your family or in your work or from a source that you just don't understand. Whatever the battle is, know that the battle is the Lord's. The second thing that uh, Paul is reminding young Timothy is, Timothy, don't stop running the race. How many of you have run the marathon at all, any time? Okay. Someday, maybe. You know, it's, how many miles is that? Huh? 26.2 miles. Not a short race. Uh, all of us can run race, especially if it is a hundred meters. I can run a hundred meters. It takes probably about 15 to 20 seconds. Okay, I'm not bold, so I'm not going to say 9, 10 seconds. I can do it in 15 or 20 seconds. Or maybe a minute now. You know, I used to be able to do that in 14 seconds when I was in high school. Not anymore, but I'm just saying, you know, for a minute, yeah, I can do it. But the race that you and I are called to run is not a short distance race. It's not for a few minutes. It's not for a, a couple of hours. It's a long, long, long race. It's a lifelong race. It doesn't end in five years or ten years, as, as we again heard the testimony. It doesn't end. It goes on and on and on. Don't give it up. Don't cut short. Last week, uh, my daughter was uh, telling us a story about her, uh, her colleague at work. Invited her to go and uh, witness the, uh, the double marathon. Now, it's not a single marathon. It's not 26.2 miles, but twice that. So you know the math, it's like, what, 52.4 miles? Can you imagine that? 
running a double marathon, even one marathon, half a marathon, I can understand. One woman told me in church very proudly this morning, I, I ran the marathon last week. Oh, wonderful for you, great. I didn't want to say, did you run the double marathon? <laughs> you don't want to say that to somebody who just ran a marathon. But last week, my, my daughter was saying that she was invited to come to the finish line of uh, this uh, double marathon race, and she went along with a friend, and uh, they were just waiting for uh, this uh, friend of hers, you know, her, her husband was in the race, and he was uh, coming, and then they were cheering him, and yeah, you did the double marathon, you know, great. He comes to the end of that line, and he says, Wait a minute. I have to do one more round. And he looked like he had just had enough of that race. And he wanted to just quit, go on the sidelines and crash. No, you can't do that. You've run so good. It's just one more round and you can do it. So they kind of cheered him and pushed him along and and lo and behold, he went for that one final round and he finished the double marathon. Everybody was happy at one o'clock in the morning. They went there at 10 o'clock. Sometimes life is like that. You think that you would expect to finish the line by certain deadline or certain time limit, but it doesn't happen that way. You need somebody to stand by and cheer you more. Don't give it up. Go for one more round and finish the race. And this is what Paul is doing to Timothy. Timothy, don't give up running the race. I know there are problems in your life. I know people are accusing you of certain things. I know that you know your, your own family uh, might be a hindrance because of the mixed race situation in his family. Maybe there were some things being said that were very cruel. I know, Timothy, you are having a struggle, but, but don't give up. Keep running the race. Are you feeling tired tonight? That you've been running this race for so many years, and how long should I do this? How long can I put up with this? What should I do? Well, the Word of God says, you know, keep, keep running, don't give it up. There's a verse about uh, that in uh, the book of Hebrews, and if you, if you can turn with me to the book of Hebrews, there's something that is very helpful for us to, to remember. All right, let's see. Book of Hebrews in chapter 12. Therefore, Verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Are you with me so far? Are you? I hope you are. Here is another secret for us. An important secret that the Word of God brings to our attention. That when we are running our race, let us be mindful of the things that hinder the race. That cause us to slow down. That tempt us to take a detour, an easy way out. Don't do it. Instead, what you and I are admonished to do by the writer of the book of Hebrews, get rid of all of that in your life that hinders and that sin that easily entangles as you learn the things. I don't know what that is for you. I'm not going to 
even start suggesting whatever that may be for you. You pray about it. Because you're running the race and you know what is hindering your run. Only you know that and God. Only you know whatever that, that sin is that this author is talking about that so easily entangles us in the race that we are running to God. Whatever that is, get rid of it. Toss it. Throw it. And let us run with perseverance. Not give up. Verse 2 makes it even more powerful for us to run this race. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Exactly the same strategy that we found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Our eyes are upon you, O God. Let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Take time to connect with the source that is able to give you the strength as you run the race. The third thing that uh, Paul is reminding young Timothy to bear in mind is to keep the faith. I think it's kind of easy to understand the battle metaphor. We understand that. It's kind of easy to relate to the, the second metaphor of uh, a race and how to run the race and some of the suggestions that uh, uh, that the Word of God provides. We can probably relate to that. But how how does one keep the faith and what does it mean to keep the faith? You're probably wondering what 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 does that mean? to keep the faith. Let me try some suggestion here. Keeping the faith is to not give up on God when everything is going against you. Keeping faith translates to trusting in God, knowing that God is good, knowing that God is faithful, knowing that God doesn't make mistakes in your life, knowing that God has a plan and a purpose that cannot and will not ever be thwarted by anything. No force on heaven or, on, or earth can do that. Trusting in that God and keeping on trusting in God. Well, you want an example. Okay. Let's go back to the Old Testament book and uh, this time we're going to look at uh, the book of Job. Again, if you are able to turn with me to the book of uh, Job, first chapter, first chapter, we read about what was happening in the life of this, uh, this man. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking, verse 13, at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing, and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Bad news. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell upon the sky, from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Verse 17, while he was still speaking on, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and your daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in 
from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. I don't know about you, but if I was Job at this point, I, I'd probably shaken my my shoes and, and fall to the ground. Enough already. How much can I take? How much? When is this ever going to end? This destruction, this devastation, this total calamity that has come upon me. How can I take it? Oh well, let, listen to the words. Verse 21. Actually, 20. After hearing all this, Job, man of God, got up. He tore up his robe and he shaved on his head. He fell to the ground. What's the next word? In worship. Worship. You know, naturally, I, I would not expect that word there. Worship. After that, that terrible news, who will worship God? Who can worship God? Who can break out in song and praise the name of the Lord? Job did. And then in verse 21, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. How do you keep faith? In times like this, how do you keep faith when, when your, your job is gone? How do you keep faith when that, that monetary sustenance that you were banking on is wiped away. How do you keep faith when that relationship that, that, that you have invested in for 5, 10, 15 years or 20 years or 25 years is being destroyed in front of your own eyes? Man called me the other day Pastor, I need to talk to you. I had known him for quite some time. I had known him when he was raising his two little girls. They were small at that time. Pastor, we have some problems. We're not agreeing on some things in our marriage and don't know what to do. been married for 15 years at that time. Well, we spoke some words, we exchanged some thoughts and prayers, prayers, and came into my office. We did some more of that. Last week again he called. I said, how are you? Pastor, my wife has left me. She has filed for divorce. I am devastated. I don't know what to do. She says I am not making enough money. That was the reason. Now I am not sure if that is the only reason, but this is what he said. Immediately I asked him, how, how, how much do you make? A hundred and twenty thousand dollars. It's not enough. Not enough. A bigger house, a better car, more appearances, more parties, more of everything that 
She dreamed her marriage would bring is what she wanted. How do you keep faith? Not easy. I really have a burden for couples, you know that. 20 years ago we started a fellowship among our own community for married couples. And my prayer is that we don't see this happen in our own fellowship. My prayer is that we would so fix our eyes upon Jesus that whether you're making $120,000 or even $100, it doesn't matter. Because God will take care of you. There were days when my wife and I didn't have more than $10 in our pockets. That was our weekly budget. $10 a week. In the early 1980s. We couldn't take our kids to McDonald's when they asked. So I said that would wipe away our weekly budget. Don't focus on the wrong things. Keeping faith means to trust in God to provide for all your needs. Husbands and wives together, get this. God has a plan in your life. God has a purpose in bringing children into your lives. Don't damage the trust that God has placed in your hands. Don't run from the battle. Don't give up on the race. Don't quit on your faith in God. Trust in God. This week, I had to attend a funeral. The funeral was uh, for someone that I had known for about 20, 25 years as a friend and a colleague in the ministry. Someone that I had sat in business sessions of the conference and uh, ministries many, many years. A wonderful person. While I was at the funeral home, many people said many things about her. And it was very gratifying to hear from people that knew this friend of mine, this clergy colleague of mine. And they were saying, oh, you know, she was such a wonderful singer. I didn't know about that. I never really heard her sing, but they had videos of her singing away and she was doing a great job. Somebody else said, oh my goodness, she was such a great friend. She did this, she did that, you know, when we needed this. Somebody else said, well, she was a wonderful mother. And the son was standing right there. I've known the son for some time. Everybody remembered this individual from their own vantage point, from their own perspective. And that's what happens in funerals, you know that. The one thing I said to the son and his wife and to the husband who was also there, that my remembrance of this person was simply that she was a very kind and gentle person. Nothing else. A very kind and gentle person. Someday you're going to die. And I say that very, very seriously. Someday I'm going to die as well. No joke. The longer you live, the more realistic you become of this fact that life doesn't go on forever and ever and ever. There's going to be a time when this life as you and I know it is going to end. My clergy friend had her, her robe and her stole standing right next to that coffin. 
I said, what a great idea. I should make sure that my, my room is dry cleaned <laughs> uh, for display. You and I are going to pass away sometime. Think about that and, and think about what people are going to talk about you when they attend your funeral. Think about that. You don't have to say it aloud. What five words can you think of that people are going to say about you? Five words. Pastor Yadu, after 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, 80 years, you want me to think about just five words? People will remember you, but they will remember for very few things. And if we think that, you know, we, we've done so many great things that people will remember every sermon I preached and, you know, every, everything I have done in my life, you know, people are going, no, 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 they're not going to remember everything. Maybe one or two things. Paul knew that. Paul was a great preacher, wrote many letters and all of that. But the last few words, this is his last will and testament, by the way. He, he didn't write anything after this. This was the last thing he wrote before his death. And he knew it was important for him to summarize his life in these three sentences. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept can you say that? Can you ask your family to write these words on your tombstone? Don't mean to be very dramatic or melodramatic about this, but uh, Billy Sunday, and you can check out his name, Billy Sunday, who was one of the greatest evangelists and preachers of the gospel in the early part of the 20th century. A great, great man of God. Preached to hundreds of millions of people. This was before the ministry of Billy Graham. They say that he led as many as a million people to faith in Jesus Christ. On his tombstone. The words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. If that's what Billy Sunday could think of putting on his gravestone, I can't think of anything better. Keep fighting. Keep fighting the good fight. The battle is the Lord's, not yours. Keep running the race, but make sure that you drop off all those extra baggage, the weight that hinders the run. And keep up the faith no matter what happens. Because you know God doesn't give up on you. I am always with you. Never leave you. Never forsake you. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord God, we thank you for your word that comes to us this evening to strengthen us on the journey. We thank you for your servant, the Apostle Paul, who had such a clear vision of who you are. Such a clear understanding of what he was called to do. We thank you that he was faithful to that which was entrusted into his hands. Oh God, we pray that you would enable us to be also faithful 